Welcome to the Remembering Akron podcast. I'm your host, Derek Maxfield, and today my guest is the colorful David Ross, a man that has a reputation that precedes him. <laughs> Welcome, David. Thank you. So your story starts back in 1939, just on the precipice of World War II. Right. Anybody in your family affected by that? My uncle. Um, Did he serve? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, my father worked in a defense plant. And uh, in 1939, um, before that, my father worked for in Akron for the Shad Funeral Home. And he and Mr. Bernhardt worked together with Mr. Shad. And uh, <clears throat> then Mr. Uh, Shad died. <clears throat> and my father could see there was going to be some negative talk around there so he moved to green new york where they worked for a funeral director during that time i was conceived and born born in medina but they came up and had me and then in 19 um i don't know it was 41 or 41 mrs shad still alive still running her store and trying to run uh, whatever funerals she would get because she wasn't a funeral director she had to hire it came down and asked my father to come back to Akron. And uh, she she and her daughter came down and stood around, hung around, and said, yeah, Adrian, you have to come back to Akron. And uh, she did. He did. And we moved back here and uh, <clears throat> used to operate out of the... We had a, she had a paint store. In the paint store was 60 Main Street. Down cellar in the paint store was a bowling alley at one time. Hmm. And then a shooting range. And then they had an embalming room down there for years and years. This is when they all worked together because they would take everybody home. Unless sometimes the bodies were embalmed at their home. And there was a lot of work, a lot of trouble, a lot of heartache, a lot of hard, hard work. And then carry everybody down these stairs and back up and go to the home with funeral all that. And during that time in 19, uh, whenever I was in kindergarten, 39, 44, 45, he found a house on John Street and started converting it into a funeral home. Hmm. And then most of the funerals during that, when he reorganized it and got it workable for a funeral, and uh, most of the funerals were there. Some still home funerals in Akron, and the native funerals were all home funerals. Took them all home, mm -hmm. and uh, he. Um, we still had the paint store until <clears throat> 60s, 70s. I don't know in the 70s by mm -hmm. when I took it over, and uh, then we. Um, it was interesting, and we. I had the funeral home, and we had the uh, button for the fire whistle when somebody would have a fire or something. They'd call us. We'd answer the phone, come down, hobble down the stairs and push the button and ring out the fire company. They'd call us. We would call the fire company. They'd call us to find out where the fire is or whatever, and we would tell them, and then um, they'd be on their way. Okay. And there was a button at the store and home. So there was always, and any time anybody was, none of us were around, we had a sitter. And she'd answer the phone, the fire company, the funeral home phone, and all this stuff. So it was interesting. That was how they used to run it years ago. Wow. Now, did your father have any, have any formal training as a, as a mortician? Yeah, he went to Syracuse, the same did place he? I did. Okay. But it was different. A different time and uh, different people running it. Yeah, we had a lot of teachers from the university there, and um, they were very good. They were very good. I learned more chemistry there in two months than I did in high school when I took it. <laughs> so, I mean, but they were very thorough, very good, and mm -hmm. it took twelve months. Then you had to do an apprenticeship at a funeral home, and then uh, a very strict test to become a funeral. They'd have a, a, a cadaver there and they'd ask you something and you could trace blood, open an artery vein or whatever. And, and then there was the uh, 
written portion of it. So it was quite intense, a little more than today. I don't think they still do the cadavers. but uh, So growing up, did you always kind of think you'd just be in the family business? No, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. But after I go to college and I see <laughs> the uh, economics and the studies, the course of study and the stuff that it sounded boring to me. And our life was never boring. And in our funeral home, we ran an ambulance service, too. Wow. Yes. Oh, yeah. We had an ambulance. And uh, we, uh, many times, when I was going to school, in high school, well, especially because you don't remember the earlier times much, but <laughs> I come downstairs, and there'd be a, in the morning, getting ready to go to school, and I uh, come downstairs, and there's a, a native lady sitting there, pregnant, needed a ride to the hospital. And uh, so we, it wasn't an emergency, but I mean, she's going to have a baby. She's contracting and all this. And so my dad would come around and uh, they'd get in the ambulance and go to the hospital. There was many mornings like that. Hmm. Lots of accidents, lots of sick people we take. And the first guy that died in my arms was um, a neighbor. He was a big guy. He and we had him on the ambulance, and on the way he died, and uh, nothing I could do. My first baby it was delivered when I was 14 or 15. I wanted to drive. He wouldn't let me. I said, I'll drive, I'll drive. He said, get. So I watched the baby being born and helped the mother. And Did you have any paramedic training? No, I had no training, no. And so then and we had three doctors in town at that time. So on the way up, after we had the baby down here in the corner of 93 and Cedar Street, <clears throat> just tell you right where he was born, and dad, my dad told me you'd take the, put him on the mother's belly and all this, and uh, did that. Pulled into the doctor's office up the street here. Little Dr. Mosier came out, and he came back to the back door, and he said, David, what are you doing? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> He's called his wife to get some string. That's what he called it. He's very German. Old. He was from Germany, and he was Jewish. And uh, Peter was get the string, and he came down. And he said, now i show you how to cut the cord. And he, you know, you do what you do. And he said, that's it. Now you go to the hospital. Okay. So we went to the hospital. Baby was fine. And, uh, you know, there's two or three of those. <laughs> wow. Before I could drive. Wow. And he wouldn't let me drive. After we, after we could drive, my buddy and I, who is a funeral, my neighbor, in fact, my good buddy all through life, became a funeral director. He's down in Vernon, oh. in Vernon and uh, the next town, whatever it is. And uh, Tommy went down there and opened a funeral home down there. Wow. He's retired now. So straight out of high school, you went to Niagara University first. Yep. But then you eventually ended up at Simmons. Mm hmm Because I didn't... Uh, there was some structure. Like today, I'd probably, um, <laughs> it probably wouldn't be happy with what's taught and what's going on mm -hmm. and the, the, the um, not doing anything. I worked on a farm from the time I was 13 or 14 to Mr. DeYoung's farm until I was about 18. And, uh, you know, it was fun. I did a good job. I got paid 50 cents an hour and uh, milked cows and went to steers, brought horses in from the railroad tracks. He, he brought in these quarter horses from Texas, and they were on a train, came into Akron. Hmm. And when they arrived, I don't know how many there were, but there was more than two or three, we'd walk them from the train station, which was down here, to down Cedar Street to his farm. And they were um, beautiful horses, and they brought them here. And <clears throat> ben had Holstein cattle finally. And got the bull from Mr. Forrestell over in Medina. So all these little things happened when you're growing up yeah. and working on a farm and, yeah. and uh, milking cows from that to steers to the fair. We raised um, my son. Well, we first started, there's another guy at work, the young guy with me. We uh, got this one steer and um, 
groomed it, tripped it, and trained it to wouldn't walk. We had to get a tractor to pull it and got him to walk around and so you could show him at the fair. And the Mr. Jiang was on the fair board and he had a gorgeous looking young son with blonde hair and tall and they'd not anything to do with the work or the farm, but we got him primed for the fair. And he went and walked around. The animal was in really beautiful shape and all this. He won the grand championship. Wow. Isn't that nice? But probably it helps with his father being on the board. But. Well, maybe. <laughs> and then we did the same thing for my son. Well, my son did it on his, on his own. He won. Uh, he had two, two of them. Did really good with both of them. Didn't win the grand champion, but he, got, he was up on top. And the bank, local bank here would buy a steer from the fair. <laughs> and one time, Mrs. Forrester, who, who family owned the bank, they sent people down from the bank to buy the steer. And uh, she was there watching the thing. And my son came around with the steer, and there was a bidding on it. And the bank was bidding, and she was bidding. The bank was bidding. She was bidding. And the guy came over from the bank and said, we're supposed to buy this. And she said, I want Michael. I want to buy that steer for Michael. Blah, blah, blah. And they bid a couple more times, and she won. <laughs> Paid him more than uh, the grand poobha there that won it. <laughs> he was happy with that. It was good for yeah, him. Good right. start. Good start. We could help him with his college. And that. But uh, that's part of the game we did in Akron. I guess. <laughs> So, um, when you finished school at, at Simmons, did you come immediately back to Akron? No, I worked in Medina and did my apprenticeship there. It's always oh, better to work for somebody else when you start out to see yeah. how they do it. Uh -huh. I did have a job in New York, but um, all my grandparents were in Medina, and uh, we even had, I had a job down there, and my, I was newly married, too, and uh, she had a job down there, and... Uh, so anyway, I came up, the guy that owned the place in Medina came to school and said he had this, you know, he wanted an apprentice. And uh, so a lot of thinking went on before we were going to move to New York and do all this. And so we decided to go to Medina. And it was a pleasant year. Plus afterwards, after I became licensed and all that, I would help the same the guy out at times. And... Uh, go to funerals that I, Catholic funerals, which I would do most, most of the stuff in the church and that, and uh, that went on for a number of years, and, uh, but then the time changes, the owner dies, his son takes over, and things change, and mm -hmm. change is good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's, then I did that, and uh, I had, uh, we had a place in Clarence, funeral home and it was not a viable one I mean it was did some business but so uh, during that time I went and got a job at the sheriff's department so my father still ran the store and the funeral home and we ran it together and I was there and I'd worked at the store well we did a lot of stuff but anyway I went and then got a job at the sheriff's department through a local fellow that was on the, uh, it was a Republican deal. I sh maybe I shouldn't be telling you all That's that. That's okay. <laughs> and uh, part of the game is you have to have a rep. It's like being a, somebody coming to the country, you need a sponsor. It was like the same, right. basically the same. So anyway, I got a job there through Ben Young, and uh, it was good. I went to, it was a good school, really good. And if you, you're classified as a New York State qualified policeman and went on patrol and he worked in the jail once in a while when somebody didn't show up and uh, once in a while when they had trouble at the hospital you go help out but I mean mostly you were on the road patrolling watching arresting speeders stuff all that normal so I mean, it was good it was good I had a good partner we worked midnights I come home you go to sleep get up and go to the store come home and go to the store and Go home and sleep, and then go back. It was a real, and I had uh, that by that time. I had uh, 
three children. And this is with your first wife, Marsha. Yep, I had them all with Marsha. And uh, so we needed more money, and this is a small town, you don't do a funeral every week and all this. And it worked out really good for us for the time. And then my father wanted to retire. <laughs> and it leaves you with another thing, what do you do? And uh, so we sold the place in Clarence, and I bought a house right next to the funeral home. And uh, came here, and which allowed him to be free. and Because they really, you know, vacation was like a, one time we were going to the, <laughs> to the I was going with him. My brother and sister didn't go with him. With him. They wanted me, the middle child, to go to Thousand Islands with him. Well, we had a, one of the guys that were a family friend gave. We had all kind. We had cars and a hearse and all this, but gave him a convertible to drive for the week or whatever we we're going to be going. We got out of town, got probably to Syracuse, and uh, he got a call at a funeral and. Uh, so I went down the road and uh, turned around and we came back home. That was one, many of his vacations were like that. So he really never had time off. Or, and then it uh, just progressed. And we do bury most of the natives here. And uh, it's... Um, so you went from being a police officer to more or less a full-time mortician. Well, yeah, but I was still one... When, when, even then I worked and we had a funeral, I was there when we needed... To embalm and do all this, I was there. Uh -huh. So, so you have to uh, sleep fast at times. Yeah, and uh, move around, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm 80 now, and uh, still able to walk without a walker. That's good. <laughs> but I mean, that's part of what you do in life when you have seven children. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how it goes. Yeah. So, um, have you ever run across people who, uh, because you're associated with the funeral home, uh, I don't know, discriminate or, or uh, I don't know, people find death kind of a taboo subject sometimes, don't they? Yeah. I just... You ever felt you were treated differently because of the association? Oh, that some people want to back off and say, "Did you wash your hands?" Stuff like that, <laughs> you know. You you know, but, but if you you don't look, you don't have to look morbid at all. You don't have to be. Oh my God! Everybody's sad. Well, it's, you know, the many times people live their life and die, and the progression like it should be, and it's, it should be a celebration many times instead of a tragedy, mm -hmm. and uh, it's how you treat it. And I don't think that. Um, People ask me how you handle this and all this with all the sadness and death and grieving and and uh, even um, you can't let it get a hold of you and you can't let it think that kids are the worst if you have a young child that dies is the worst for anybody, even us. And uh, I've seen a lot of tragedies. I've seen a lot of torn apart people and heads off bodies and um, murders and pretty basic much of everything and uh, you just got to take care of it mm -hmm. and that's what you're supposed to do and uh, even with my mother when she died somebody asked me if, who's going to work on her I said well you think that she want anybody else to work on her but me my father didn't he kind of came around and Hit suggestions now and then, but anyway, I, you know, you do, you take care of your own too. And uh, oh, was the uh, yeah, she died at home, and uh, I, <laughs> and the she was Catholic. The priest came, and he covered her up, and I said, "Don't oh, just pull the sheet off." And he said, "Just she's she's gone to wherever she's going," and he, well, well, and he said, "That he's the one that asked me," and I said, "I'm doing it." He had a little fit of over it, and I, but I mean, I did what I do, and uh, worked out good. And um, now, um, so those things is how you carry on. And yeah, have you seen attitudes toward death change over the course of your career? Oh yeah, yeah. I used to be uh, people used to be very. Um, 
traditional, very want to do it the way they thought their parents or whatever wanted to do or their husband or whatever. And uh, it's, it's not always the expense of it, which is like everything else, it's up. But uh, they would want to do it. They want to have a casket. They want to have a cemetery plot and, and some other thing. Then you got these mausoleums that are above ground, and there are people that don't want to be put in the ground and don't want to be cremated. So that's a purpose for that, which is which is fine. <laughs> but uh, the attitude today is they're younger. Well, then oh, probably. 15 years or so that these kids go to college travel all over the country live in different places and mom and dad gets sick or dies and um, they have they don't have any that's like they're um, they don't have anything to do with it lots of times you know just we have a lot uh, had some not as much in Akron as you have we had a place in Lockport and one in Wilson, and uh, they'll call it, they'll say, "Oh, just get them cremated," and uh, they're busy. This this is, happens more than once, and uh, <laughs> you send me a bill, stuff like that. I had one kid from California come home. His father was had died, and uh, came home, saw the mother and his brothers. Sisters and uh, he had the same name as his father. Went to the bank, one of the banks in the city, cleaned out the account, went back to California. See, this is the type of people you, some of these people have today. And, and then there are people that want them cremated but want a service, which is good. They don't want to show the body, which is sometimes it's it's uh, it eliminates the awareness of what's happened. Number one, if you don't see the person that's dead, which would be a, a good thing to do unless they're in a real tragic accident, and um, it helps with the grieving process. It gets over sooner, and it doesn't really ever get over, but I mean, you, you right. handle it better. And uh, the people, oh no, I don't want to see the person and all this. Well, that's, um, that's too bad, mm -hmm. you know. I understand that some funeral directors have a problem with remains that do not get claimed. True. I had a whole bunch here when I, before I went to retire, I went to South Carolina. And then my wife took sick and I came, we came back here for my, all my kids were here. But uh, yeah, we had a lot of cremations. You call up the families and, and usually the wife has died since or the husband was died first and there's cremations in here. <laughs> and the kids, you call up who's left or in Montana or wherever. I say, oh, my goodness, you still got her or him or whatever? I said, yeah. I said, do you want me to ship them to you? Want them? What do you want to do? Oh, no, just get rid of them. And uh, <laughs> that was with probably, hmm, probably 16 of them that I had. Wow. Some came... Some were going to be in town in the summer. I was trying to get rid of these people in this, that were there in the summer. And uh, they come home, 4th of July here, and celebrations and all that. And I'll pick them up then, I'll pick them up then. And they did treat them a little differently than some people that are gone. And that's their own choice, that's all. It's everybody has a different feeling. And some people are scared to death of death. Mm -hmm. And the par part of the problem is they don't bring their kids to a funeral. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know what death is. I have a, my, my sister just lost her daughter, who was 40. She had Teresa's 41 or 2. She got two kids, one 14 and one 16, two boys, very athletic. And she just dropped dead. And uh, she, my sister calls, is calling me because she's in Ohio. And... Uh, I said, well, how are the boys and all that? She says, you know, she said, um, they've never really been to church. I said, oh, okay. I mean, my sister and her husband go all the time, and this, the, the kids are different. 
I said, oh, do they know what uh, what it's about in church? Or I said, well, maybe you should do a little explaining and kind of give a hint of where she may have gone or whatever happens after death. And, uh, well, she said, yeah, one time uh, she was in church and the priest walks down the aisle before Mass and the kid was six or five or something. He looked at and he said to his mother, he said, is that God? See, this is their, so there's no training. Mm -hmm. No, that was you know, un, not important in their life. So that's a tragic part of it. But the kids, since she died a couple, two months ago, they've handled it very well. And uh, there's been a lot of support through my sister and, her, and the other, her husband's family. They're going to throw out the first pitch at the Cleveland game September 14th, the two boys. Hmm. They're from near Cleveland. And uh, that's the things they're doing. She's got a pool and the kids. She's seen more of the kids now than she's seen in the whole life. Hmm. And, uh, and they all live in close proximity. But th she did it different. And um, they had a visitation. And, um, you know, they had never been to one. <laughs> and there's been people that die every day in your life and uh, that's too bad it's, they don't have to stay but they should be aware of what's going on mm -hmm. where do you think this profession will be in 20 years I think it'll be less funeral directors um, there's always going to be people that want to bury their dead there's going to be more cremations because that's a quick way to get rid of mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, a fewer funeral homes. You won't find as many funeral homes. You'll find them. Um, it's happening now. And uh, probably very callous funeral directors. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, no, no, no caring or sympathy or whatever you have for the family. More business like. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like you're like you're going to Walmart. Mm -hmm. I that's because I can't stand when I when we call down south, somebody's died, and we and they call us first, and we can call a funeral home to arrange to get whoever home because we can do it from our place here down there because there's a there's a service that handles the United States, and. Uh, once in a while, you have to call the funeral and give them some information that handles in this, 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 uh, some of this answering the phone is, it's like a holiday, it's a Hollywood movie, the, the sympathetic serve, you know, this phony voice on and all that. And then when they find out you're a funeral director, they talk normal to you. So I, I think they should be real and, and real people and, uh, treat it the way you want to be treated. That's mm -hmm. all. That's what, that's my feeling. You've been a busy man, uh, not just uh, with your profession. Uh, you've been involved uh, in politics. In politics, you've been involved in, in the churches. You've been involved in the village planning board. When do you find time to sleep? <laughs> I've been told that a few times. I had a lot of kids. Look at that, a lot of kids. <laughs> there was a lot of people home. I had to get out of town. <laughs> yeah. Why'd you go into politics? Because I was, I was when I was in Syracuse. That's when Kennedy ran for office, mm -hmm. and I was a staunch Kennedy supporter. I had a Volkswagen with all these stickers on, and I had never been in, realized what goes on. So I pull in town on a weekend. I, I worked at a funeral home down there when I went to school. <laughs> I pull in the driveway at my father's house. There's a guy sitting there who's who was a um, probably a, a, a Republican committee man. And my dad, he never dwelt, he never went, he said, you stay out of that and all this. But anyway, all these stickers on my car and all that. He said, you got to get out of town. You know, he, this is the guy. He's, I said, well, I'm just home for the weekend. I'll be out of town in a couple of days and all this. And and he was fine after, but I mean, I, you didn't realize how you affect people with what you may believe in. And um, after the election and all that, and I grew up a little bit, saw what was going on, and uh, was interested. That's all. 
I was on the committee, and Tom Perry, the and Don Whiting, who's Don Whiting was the mayor, and Tom and I ran the same election year, and uh, Perry's ice cream and Whiting Door and all this, you all know, right. and me and uh, I, I good for, I, voting was here, something was here. <laughs> I'm in this room during the election with another guy that was running against me, he's a Democrat, nice guy. We were good buddies. And uh, I beat him pretty good. And uh, But we always, you know, it wasn't really political, and the board was not really political. You try to do, back then, you try to do what was good for the village, people here. And it basically, it's still done almost that way. They gotta remember there's people there living in the village. You represent them. And uh, the building inspector's a problem here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's things that are a problem, you know, and then uh, some of the arrogance of the people that are on the board um, shows, in my opinion. So I don't get involved with them. Hmm. So you must really find the current political climate nationally very interesting. Oh, it is. Fun. Fun. And I'm a Trump supporter, so that's, well, you know, whether you like him or not, I'm, I'm not afraid to say that. And they'll say, oh, you're not. I don't like him. My brother, he's a, <laughs> my brother's a retired uh, in de defense intelligence guy. He was a ranger, paratrooper, and all this stuff, and... He lived in Iran for five years, all these things he did. And uh, go to his house down in Fairfax, Virginia, and uh, nice guy. He's always been, everybody loved him here more than they loved me because <laughs> I was the middle child. <laughs> but anyway, I go down there, and my boy, we went to, we were going to Myrtle Beach. I lived there for five years, oh. six years. And uh, <laughs> my son and my daughter and I were there, and he, they have a big table, and he's got five boys. And so two or three of them came. To, we're having dinner, and all. we're on our way to South Carolina. Somehow the politics came up. Now, he's a lifelong government employee. I mean, he went to Notre Dame and Johns Hopkins, didn't want to be a doctor. He came up, well, that's another story. But anyway, uh, boy. Talk about Democrats. Whoa. I couldn't believe that he grew up here. But I mean, he, well, he gets his money. He, he's made very good money. He's made, they made him good investments when he was in Vietnam. He did all these things that, because he's out of town a lot. <laughs> and they were growing up. The family lived here for a short time when he was in Vietnam. And, uh, but, I mean, he just was fortunate all the way through to get to be a major, um, colonel. But you give up your titles when you become a... You go into these... Um, he was in the Iranian expert. And when you go into the intelligence... Diplomatic Corps? Yeah. You know, well, Defense Intelligence Agency. Okay. That's what he... During that time, um, he worked the State Department and that. They make pretty good bucks, these guys, these analysts. He became out of a section because he lived in, in uh, Iran, and uh, he uh, knew the leader. <laughs> so anyway, he, um, he did my son, so my, my son looked at me and, so we shut up about politics. <laughs> but that's that's why they become interested. Mm -hmm. And I've been down there two or three times since the election, and uh, we don't talk politics. I mean, he's not going to change. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't, but my sister's like me. They're in Ohio, and her husband's a staunch Trump guy and all this stuff. And uh, that's how it goes. That's all. So we're out of time now. I have the, mo the most difficult question for last. Good. So think, think about a generation from now, and you're gone, and your grandchildren are telling their children about you. What would you hope they say? 
that uh, Grandpa was always there for him. And I was... Um, Um, what do they call it? They, I was, I had no filter. I mean, they all know that. And, uh... You're frank. Very. And, uh, they don't, um... I don't think they'll have anything bad to say about me. Would you offer any advice, if you could? Just be good workers and good people, that's all. All right, and on that note, David, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening in, and remember to tune in to the next episode of Remembering Akron.